Welcome to 73 Mentors. I'm your co-host, Jason Vidari. And I'm your other co-host, Vincent Vidari. And those of you that have been with us for a while, we know we're doing the countdown of the 73 most influential people who have ever lived. We actually started at number 22 with Plato. We've also already talked about number 21, Galileo. And we just finished up number 19, Karl Marx. So today we're starting a new person at number 19 on our list, and that's Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin lived in, um, in England in the years 1809 to 1882. Now, if you follow with Karl Marx, you'll realize that, that, was, that those two were contemporary with each other. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also hit into, in this discussion, we'll be hitting into Darwin in his early years, um, his, really his school years, and get to know what Darwin was like as a kid. Uh, most probably know that Darwin um, is known for bringing about the theory of evolution by a natural selection. And that's quite a controversial issue still, and it kind of surprised me as I was doing more research on this, but we'll be just touching into that a little bit, but like I said, mostly we'll be into Darwin's early life. So let me just get a little more background here, and I'll, and I'll tell you one of his uh, stories as a kid, which I found pretty funny. Um, like I said, he's born in, uh, actually born in uh, Shrewsbury. This is northwest of London in 1809. He is the fifth of six children. He has four sisters and one brother. And uh, when, he was a, when he was a kid, and probably around eight, nine years old, about that age, um, he had a friend named Garnet. And Garnet, they were went to the store together. And Garnet goes up to the store and he pick, gets some things to purchase. And he just walks out the store with Charles. And Darwin's like, well, he's like, well, that's a, how'd, you, how'd you do that? And this, this, his friend Garnet tells him, hey, my uncle was um, a famous uncle. He did a lot for the town, so I get free stuff. I just have to wear this particular hat and I turn it a certain way. And the store owners let me get what I want. And so they went to the next door. And this Garnet kid did the same thing. He got some things, turned his hat a certain way, and walked out. And, and Charles was all excited about that. And then his, his friend Garnet said, well, you want to try it too? I'll, I'll let you use this hat, and you can go in the store yourself. And, of course, he's excited to go do that. So he goes in the, the store of cakes, gets himself a few cakes, um, turns his hat a certain way, and starts walking out the door. And right after that, the, the, cake, the cake owner, the store owner, came chasing after him. He said he dropped the cakes and took off running. <laughs> and there were his friends, or his so-called friends, laughing at him the whole way. And um, a, a typical kid story, uh, tricks, tricks to do to each other, but also kind of showed him. I guess Gar, uh, Darwin, in his own words, said that it shows how simple of a kid he was. Or maybe gullible might be how we would frame it these days. But I thought that was a fun a fun little story of his of his early days. So, why don't you, Vince? Why don't you bring us over and we'll hit a little more of his early and some of his family life and. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> uh, he had an older brother, Erasmus was his older brother, and they actually went to school together for a brief time. Uh, they both attended medical school in Edinburgh uh, later in life. Well, one of the interesting things about his older brother too is that at one point <clears throat> when they were both uh, at home, they, they, uh, Erasmus built a chemistry lab and Darwin and, and he uh, spent a lot of time in, in making certain gases and chemicals and Darwin actually spent so much time there and, and Erasmus did too that they said they stayed up really night, late uh, conducting all of the experiments and Darwin actually gained the name of gas. That's what they called him because he spent so much time in the chemistry lab. Uh, one interesting aspect about his parents is that his mother died when he was eight years old. And it, he didn't really say much in his auto, this is, we're reading his autobiography. He really didn't elaborate much on outside of, he just recalls what she was dressed in when she died. But other than that, it doesn't, didn't seem to, I don't know, phase him is, is, Probably the right word. It I think what he said, he said in there, he said that he kind of counted that to his sisters. For one, they didn't talk about it much, but then he seemed like he just got taken care of by them and, and then going to boarding school pretty soon. Is what I gathered from that. I was like, yeah, yeah. kind of moved on with life and it was just. Just part of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that's kind of filling out his background. We'll get, we're going to talk a lot about his father because his father had a huge influence on him. Uh, I will mention at this point and maybe a little bit later too is that 
his oldest sister, Caroline, uh, educated him until he went to boarding school. Again, once his mom died at eight years old, shortly thereafter he entered boarding school. So up until eight years old, which is, which is interesting, is that he was being schooled at home by his sister. So uh, I, I thought that was fascinating. It was fascinating that he didn't, he didn't really start, quote, formal school until he was eight years old either. Yeah. And one thing you get, get, get from him right away is this, um, I guess, uh, his, his curiosity seemed to be there right away. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I took actually from a little thing you shared before, Vince, talking about uh, the chemistry and play with chemistry. Actually, one of his teachers heard about that and told him that he's wasting his time on basically useless subjects. <laughs> now, as a chemical engineer, I, have a, I take quite offense to that. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives you the idea. On, well, it gives you a couple ideas, right? One is that often, you know, we may not know what the future holds and what would be important and what's not important. Um, but I think on, on Charles Darwin's side, it shows his just that curiosity. And he talks about he, even at a young age, he start collecting things, shells and plants and just minerals. He's kind of a collector. Um, and um, I found that fun too. Uh, I guess I should say this. I just found it fun to read an autobiography from one of these people that were, were, mm-hmm. were investigating. And, and uh, I guess a lot of his, his young life kind of resonated with me and maybe some of the, the paths I've, I've taken in my own life. Um, but I really like that. One I, one I was kind of envious of was his collecting. I think throughout my life, I tried to do collections, like a stamp collection. Nothing ever seems to resonate. I, I think I would probably do gold coins. Yeah. But they're a little too expensive. <laughs> uh, so, but that was neat. Another part of the collection um, was his fascination with beetles. And a little bit later on in his life, he did a collection of beetles, which I thought was pretty interesting too. I collect, you actually collect beetles? It's like, yeah. And um, I guess it was kind of big at the time. He said it was a, a well-known thing at the time. Maybe I missed out on that one too, but I had a, there's a funny little story along that line as well. And um, you eventually might have to go and share that story with yeah, us as, uh, yeah, as you have sure. it, I think. So again, he's collecting beetles. And so <laughs> this is his, in Charles Darwin's words, uh, it was mere passion for collecting for I did not dis- dissect them and rarely compared their external characters with published descriptions but got them named anyhow. I will give a proof of my zeal. One day on tearing off some old bark, I saw two rare beetles and seized one in each hand. Then I saw a third, a new kind, which I could not bear to lose. So I popped the one which I held in my right hand into my mouth. Alas, it ejected some intensely acrid fluid, (laughs) which burnt my tongue so that I was forced to spit the beetle out which was lost as well as the third one. <laughs> <laughs> that's so serious I, collecting right there. <laughs> that's it. So the beetle he was talking about, it's, it's known to produce this very acidy uh, <laughs> excretion. So, and he may not have known that when he, obviously he threw it in his mouth. He didn't know that, but I thought that was, that was he, he loved them so much. He would actually put one in his mouth so that he could collect another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, another thing he developed a little bit as he got a little bit older was this um, a real zeal for shooting um, during, I guess, when kind of his college, his early college days or his late high school days. Um, relative to us, he really got into shooting and, and did that a lot during his free time. And I'll read a little quote from him I thought was funny. He said, in the latter part of my school life, I became passionately fond of shooting. And I did not believe that anyone could have sworn more zeal for the most holy cause than I did for shooting. And a couple other parts he talks about, he, he had his shoes set there. So when he got up in the morning, he slipped right into his shooting shoes and go, go shooting right away. Um, and I, I had to laugh later on, his, his dad, you get the impression that his dad didn't, that he was almost going to turn into a sporting man that would just shoot and hang out and shoot and hang out yeah. with the guys all day long, but his, his dad wasn't going to have it. <laughs> so he has that aspect. The other, I think he, he read, he wasn't really fond of school, but there are certain times in his autobiography he's mentioned some things that influenced him, one of which was a book called Wonders of the World. And this was a book about different discoveries throughout the world. Mm-hmm. And this gave him a desire to start traveling uh, to remote locations, of which we'll get to in uh, future discussions. But example would be uh, joining the Beagle in order to, to discover uh, new new insects and birds and all these other things as, as a naturalist. So 
that's one thing. I guess the only last thing there, Jason, about uh, that we'll discuss is that he was able to move in several different directions and not necessarily have a focus early on just because he realized of the financial stability that he had because we'll get we'll discuss this in more in depth but his father was a well-known physician and a, a fairly wealthy gentleman and so he would charles darwin was going to or did inherit a fairly substantial amount of money um so from his father who was who was so um who again had some fi financial stability yeah i thought that was interesting was in the, in it got me to thinking about, you know, how we, we form our past in life and our, especially our career. And, and then you, you, at least from the descriptions we've have of, of, of Charles, like he it seemed like he's kind of interested in certain things, kind of, kind of looking around, but not, like you said, he wasn't really interested in, in lectures and in, in school. It just, that didn't resonate with him, but getting out with his hands and actually getting on the field and observing things, that seemed to be where his strength was at. Yeah. And so another thing in his, his childhood that was interesting, I thought, was that he created falsehoods. And one of the ones that he did share in his autobiography, he basically said he created a lot of falsehoods, of which he shared this one where he told classmates that he could change certain flower colors depending on the fluid or water that he would, he would uh, put on them hmm. or, or, or water them with, so, which was clearly a lie. But he just thought he could trick his uh, classmates into believing that. <laughs> that may have just be the environment. Maybe that's the, I mean, right? Would you, yeah. They didn't have video games back then. This is a different time. Like, what do you do? <laughs> you, uh, you play with your friends, play games, trick them. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what it was. I mean, but he, I, I mean, I got the sense too. It was never to be malicious. No. I mean, it wasn't, do, he was doing it to, to generate excitement in, uh, around his discussions and around other people. So, and it wasn't to hurt anyone, so I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, it, go ahead, Jason. You already mentioned a little bit about his his intellect and his, his love of or lack of love for school, but in some of his shooting, there's a couple couple quotes there. Yeah, let me read this one here. He said this: um, "You care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching, and you'll be a disgrace to yourself and all your family." <laughs> That, that was his father who said that to him at one point. <laughs> yeah, all he liked is shootings, dogs, and rat catching. And, uh, yeah. So I thought, oh, wow, that, that's pretty. But he goes on to say that he really admired his father. So his father wasn't uh, being harsh by any means. Uh, there was another, another uh, Charles Darwin's perspective on education or the intellect was this. He said, quote, education environment produce only a small effect on the mind of anyone and that most of our qualities are innate, which I found fascinating is that he didn't seem to think that you can nurture or the environment would nurture your intellect. I mean, you're basically have what you have and that's what you have to work with. And for him, I guess maybe it was true. I mean, he, he, again, his curiosity, helped him propel a long way. And he did mention this, that his curiosity was unique. To his curiosity was beyond that of his siblings uh, and other people. And his ability to, to collect stuff and look at stuff had always been there. He never knew where it came from. It was just there. So yeah. Yeah, maybe that's why he, why he attributes that to um, being an innate ability. It is curious though, because I mean, we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more about it here, but the he seemed like he had a very rich environment in terms of the people he started associating with in his, in his young life and his, his schooling days here yeah. and um, being able to work over intellectual ideas with them and to associate with them and to have, be part of these different groups. I mean, you think he, he might've saw that as, Hey, that was really fundamentally changing and that's where you, you develop. But maybe he's saying there's something under uh, innate underneath that. That's, you didn't see that changed, I guess. Yeah. So we already mentioned that his father, <laughs> he, he really admired his father and his father, he said, was the biggest man he ever knew, and he big, biggest in a, a several different frames. And <laughs> his father was six uh, two and over three hundred and thirty pounds, and so he's a big gentleman. Uh, with he was a physician, a highly success, successful physician in the area, and his father practiced for sixty years as a physician in, in this area, and in 
Charles, Charles Darwin's estimation, it was not, he wasn't overly scientific. It was a mm -hmm. lot of intuitive diagnosing and treating. And he, he attributed several things to his father, one of which was his father had an extraordinary ability to read people. Uh, he had the uh, sharpness of observation, either innately or when Charles knew, he just had it. He could read character. He could read symptoms very well. He just knew people very well. And he reported to Charles on, on, on occasion that how people could drink alcohol. Some people could drink. He basically advocated that people not drink alcohol. But then he said, I can tell whether someone could drink a lot of alcohol or not of alcohol just by looking at them and whether or not they could handle it. But he, again, discouraged it. And then there was the, the discussion or the story that he mentioned that a, cler a new clergyman had moved into the area. And several of the individuals around him were very excited about this clergyman. But he said his father had, had, would have nothing to do with him. And Charles always wondered why. And he's like, he, his father never gave an explanation. But in a very short time, what was found out that, that the clergyman was a fraud. and was basically cast out of town. And Charles was just, again, it gives an idea of how perceptive his, his father was in dealing with people. His father was always very sympathetic. And I guess, as a, I mean, I would expect as a physician that would be the case. Some examples were, at first, when he first started practicing, he would tell when female patients would come in, uh, mothers or would start to cry about certain situations. And he'd just tell them to stop crying. But he realized, for, in a fairly short manner that if he told them to stop crying, they'd even cry more. So he changed his approach and he said, go ahead and cry. It's good for you to cry. And he, he, Charles Darwin's father realized that if he told them that, then in a very short time that they would stop crying. So mm -hmm. those are examples. And he, he also learned that the physician, as a physician, he also learned that he had to give his patients hope. He, hope with truth. And again, he you part of the healing process is having hope um, hmm. and towards Charles Darwin's father's end of his life he he was bound to a wheelchair or uh, he couldn't walk very far and Charles Darwin always used to ask his father why don't you go out to the roads why don't you take travel and he said you know every road I look down there's always pain because he'd been there treating different people for so long that he was so sympathetic that by that time in his life there every road that led from his house to anywhere in, in the surrounding areas had some association with pain. So he was very, basically would remain at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it had to do with his good memory too. He talked oh, about yeah. how yeah. he can remember things so well, and especially dates. Apparently once mm -hmm. he knew a date, it was there forever. And he said it was kind of an annoyance too, because <laughs> these dates would come up. Well, you can imagine as you get older, right? Mm -hmm. Every date is probably associated with some tragedy that happened. And he said that those would come to his mind and he didn't seem to be able to, to block that out or filter it or whatever. And it's became an annoyance. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I think hey, Vince, other, Vince, check your mic. There's a, there's a, a thumping. You want to, it's like when it wobbles or something, I'm getting a thumping. It's got a, can you hear it? Yeah, Is I can hear it. it. Did, 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 did. It's gone now. It's, it's gone one right there. It's not doing it right now, but when you, I don't know if it's shaking a little bit or what, but it's getting a, did, 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 did. Okay. It's not there right now. Okay. How about now? It's good? It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I, Charles Darwin's father was named Robert. So Robert, the other thing that was interesting about um, Dr. Dr. Darwin was that at one point, a gentleman came that was a manufacturer in the local area. And he came to Dr. Darwin and said that he needed 10,000 pounds or he'd go bankrupt. His company would go bankrupt. Mm. And again, keep in mind, Dr. Darwin was a great, great, great at distinguishing the character of these individuals. So he immediately gave him 10,000 pounds. Now to give you a perspective on what 10,000 pounds is in, in, during that time, it's about $1.5 million today. <laughs> and this, this gentleman had no collateral. He had nothing to back it up on. He just asked, Dr. Darwin to lend him 10,000 pounds or our equivalent again, $1.5 million. And Dr. Darwin did. And he eventually got his money back. I mean, the, the gentleman paid him. And again, I think it just plays into or, or illustrates how good of a character, um, 
how good, how successful he is at, at reading people. And I, I mean, I guess if you're going to put $1.5 million out there, you better be able to read people. But again, it, it points to that. Yeah, definitely does. Um, one of the things I really liked about um, what Dr. Darwin said is, um, if you want to say a formula for success, here we are, you know, looking at these uh, 73 influencers of history and asking, you know, how, how can they be our mentors today? Well, here's a little tidbit from, from Dr. Darwin. He said, he maintained that the chief element of success was exciting confidence. Mm. So if you're excited or have that enthusiasm and you have confidence in what you're doing, that that's your chief element to be successful in whatever you're in, endeavoring to do. Mm. And I thought about that for a bit. I go, that's, that's, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, if you think about anybody that has a, you know, an enthusiasm and excitement for the work they're doing and they have a confidence about them, man, you, you, it's almost, they're almost like magnets, right? You, you see someone like that. It's like, ah, that person's got it together. They're going somewhere. Um, now, so, I, so I think there's a lot of truth in that. Some, some, some to think about in our own, wherever we might be in our own work or practice and think, am I, am I bringing enthusiasm, excitement? Am I bringing confidence? Um, and, and maybe working on those ways on how we can bring more of that. So that's good. And one of the other golden rule, a golden rule that Dr. Darwin passed on to his son was, quote, never become the friend of anyone whom you cannot respect. And Charles said this was a very difficult one for him to maintain throughout his life. <laughs> and I think we should mention this, Jason, is that this autobiography was written when he was in his 60, 66, 67 years old. Yeah. So again, he's, he's a fairly old gentleman by this time that he's writing this. He's, he mostly wrote it for his family, he said, so that they could have something to reflect on. Uh, and so, again, so this is looking back, and he's just saying that, you know, his father passed on this golden rule to never become the friend of anyone whom you cannot respect. Mm. Again, really great advice. Really great advice. Now, go ahead, Jason. You want to talk about some of his influence as far as his intellectual development? Yeah, we, we touched on it just a bit. But, yeah, as he, you know, as he grew up and then um, went from – living at home in the boarding house and going to first he went to college where his, where his brother was at and along the lines of to be a physician like his father. Um, but he seemed to, like, like I say, he seemed to have this rich environment because he talks about all these pe different people he met and, you know, these different professors and professionals in different areas um, or even the other students that he would interact with. And I couldn't help but just feel impressed by, I go, Maybe it's my intellectual side, right? And, and my enjoyment of even having discussions like this, Vince. I was like having, having discussions like this, except doing it on a more regular basis where it's a daily activity. Yeah. And you're doing it with, you know, 20 other different people and professionals and experts in their different areas. Yeah. Um, and how it just seemed like it would be a really rich environment and, and a place that would, that would cultivate people like, like, like Charles Darwin yeah. and, and the contributions that he would make. Um, let me go ahead and um, I want to read one of these that – talks about that <clears throat> and this is really actually this, this moves us ahead a little bit it gets us to where he met um met professor henslow who becomes an influential person in his life but i thought this kind of frames some of this rich environment he says this was my friendship with professor henslow before coming to cambridge i had heard of him from my brother as a man who knew every branch of science and i was accordingly prepared to reverence him he kept opening his house once every week where all undergraduates and several other members of the university who were attached to science used to meet in the evening. I soon got through Fox, which is an, another gentleman, an invitation and went there regularly. Before long, I became well acquainted with Henslow and during the latter half of my time at Cambridge, took long walks with him on most days so that I was called by some, some of the dons, the man who walks with Henslow. <laughs> and in the evening, I was very often asked to join his family dinner. His knowledge was great in botany, etymology, chemistry, mineralogy, and geology. Hmm. So a little taste there. I mean, that was associated with Kenslow, but it, or Henslow, but it was other. He talks about other other times like that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll I'll just read this one part that this is again later in his life, and he's reflecting back on this time that he spent with all these gentlemen, uh, different of different uh, educational backgrounds. Keep in mind that when Charles Darwin is saying this, he's in his late teens, early twenties at this point. And these individuals are fairly well known 
uh, English professors or well-known just in science in general. And this is what he writes about that time. We used, to off we used often to dine together in the evening, though these di dinners often included men of higher stamp, and we sometimes drank too much. We jolly, with jolly singing and playing at cards afterwards, I know that I ought to feel ashamed of the days and evenings that thus spent, but as some friends of mine, but as some of my friends were very pleasant and we all in the highest spirits, I cannot help look back on these times with much pleasure. So again, I think Jason's mentioned is that you know, he was able to go around in these circles with individuals who were well known and enjoy themselves and have these rich conversations that most people weren't having at that time, at least it didn't appear that there were, he didn't mention there were any of his colleagues that were here. These were all men of us already established. So uh, I, I thought that was fascinating. And I think it, he may not, I think looking back, he may realize how influential that was in, in uh, forming his view on and perspective on life. And the thing I appreciate about that little one that you just read, Vince, is that, you know, he talks about he should be ashamed of this, you know, wasting his time drinking and it could, it could have been more productive doing other things. Yeah, he has to, he has to, looks back with a pleasure still. And it got me to thinking about, you know, where's that value in life? Where, where's that meaning? And, you know, almost you get back to the, our, our main question we ask here often is how do you live that good life? Mm -hmm. Is it making meaningful contributions and scientific discovery? I think he probably would say, yeah, I got a lot of joy and, and I made a difference that way. But yeah, here's, a, here's a, maybe a smaller incident where he's looking back with joy as well. It's spending time with friends, sharing yeah. memories, creating memories with them, having a good time. And I, maybe that just resonated with me. It's like, yeah, I, I also can look back at my life and, and those things are valuable for me too. Again, maybe I wasn't learning something new, making, making a great con contribution to society in that moment. But connecting with other people and making memories, I think is important. And so it seems like part of our our social being as, as humans that we, that we're like that. At least it resonated with me that way. Yeah, no, I think that's true. That's true. And I, I, well, I was going to share just one more quote. Uh, this is from a gentleman, uh, Sir J. McIntosh, again, a, a well-established gentleman in the community. And he shares this about after a discussion. So back up a little bit, uh, Charles Darwin considered him the best conversationalist he ever encountered. So this is, uh, tr this is what Macintosh, Sir Macintosh said about Charles Darwin. He said, this must have, there is something in that young man that interests me. And then Charles Darwin comes back in his autobiography and said, this must have been chiefly due to his perceiving that I listened with much interest to everything which he said. For I was an ignorant, I was ignorant as a pig about his subject of history, politics, and moral philosophy. To hear praise from an eminent person, though no doubt apt or certain to excite vanity, is, I think, good for a young man as it helps to keep him in the right course. Hmm. So, again, I, these, these gentlemen took him, and maybe, maybe it was in Charles Darwin's eyes that he was just listening. He was intently listening to what they said because they were such prominent figures within the whole culture that he, that's the only position he had. But he showed interest. I think that's the, the, I guess, one of the take homes is that if we show interest in what other people are saying, they're more willing to spend time with us. And he even praised Charles Darwin in this case. And again, Charles Darwin realizes he's ignorant about everything that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. he, was just, he was just intensely listening to see what he could understand. Yeah. In, and Charles talked about himself saying that he, in terms of his intellect, in terms of his natural abilities, he didn't see that he had that much. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess we talked about a little bit before we started discussing on, on the recording here, but so maybe he didn't see some of that in himself because, you know, you see that you're talking about this. He, he's, he's hanging out with prominent people like reg, fairly regularly at this time in his life. I'm like, that's, that's unusual. There must mm -hmm. be something in your character. Maybe this is exactly what you just read that he was interested in them. Mm hmm I imagine at some point you got to carry some conversation on with these gentlemen. Otherwise it'd be like this, got this, this kid's hanging around just listening to us all the time. What's he doing here? <laughs> right. But he, but I, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think he just underestimated how intellectually gifted he was. I think that's mm -hmm. part of it. Is that again, maybe it's so innate with him or was with him that he didn't realize he was 
potentially gifted in, in some, some way, shape or manner. And maybe the gift is just listening and assimilating knowledge that way. Yeah. No, could have been. But it's funny, he listened in those situations, but then he talked about not liking lectures. Yes. So within certain, maybe, was, maybe he enjoyed the, the a real conversation. Maybe that was part of it. You know, it, it gets me to that, maybe that question I asked early, earlier on is, um, or at least I've thought it, maybe I didn't ask it. <laughs> is that, um, how do we, what's the best way for us to learn, right? We have, in our society right now in 2019, it's still very much, hey, you go to school, go through, go through high school, go to college, get your degree, and then you're set up for, for a successful life. Now that may be changing a little bit. I hear more, more alternative avenues out there, but that's still very much the formula. And I guess you can say Charles Darwin kind of followed that too, but it seems a lot, a lot of his enrichment came outside of that formal, formal path. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that's, I think he would say that too, because there are multiple times, that even within this, the first part of this autobiography that he did, he blatantly says that he thought school was a waste of time. They didn't really <laughs> teach me anything. And lectures were in particular a waste of time. So but he had interest outside of school. And I think that's what propelled him uh, to continue to learn. And I think that's what, at least in his estimation, is what really stuck. It doesn't sound like was, very few of the lectures stuck. What, mm. Very few of what the people said in formal schooling stuck. It was what he did afterwards. Yeah. And as we already mentioned, I, it, we'll talk about it now, is that as I already mentioned, his sister Caroline was, the, was taught him until the age of eight. And then he went to a boarding school, which was in town. And it, it, there's a, a good story about that, Jason. Do you want to say that, that story? About? Yeah, I like this one. Because to me, and this is going back to his a little younger life when he went to boarding school after his, his mother died. But to me, it gave me a real sense of, of Charles Darwin, I guess, he, at least as a kid, and, and what things were like for him. And he says this, I boarded at this school. So I had the great advantage of, of living the life of a true schoolboy. But as the distance was hardly more than a mile to my home, I very often ran there in the longer intervals between the callings over and before locking up at night. This, I think, was in many ways advantageous to me by keeping up home affections and interest. I remember in the early part of my school life that I often had to run very quickly to be on time. And from being a fleet runner was generally successful. But when in doubt, I prayed earnestly to God to help me. And I well remember that I attributed my success to prayers and not to my quick running and marveled how generally I was aided. Hmm. I just thought it was interesting. So he's, here he is living outside of his home in a boarding school, but it's not too far away, about a mile away from his home. So he still has his connections there with his family and his sisters. And um, his brother's actually with him at school, at, some, at least at some of it. And, but then also gives us some ideas, because this is, I think, where we're going to hit a lot of controversy with, with, with Darwin is, is – the, the interaction of these, the theory of evolution with religion. And at least for him in his early days, um, he grew up with, with um, and I, we would classify as a Christian home and with those beliefs. And here in his early life, he's basically praying, praying to God to help him to get to school on time when he's running late. <laughs> and he, he, he felt aided in that, in that endeavor that it wasn't his own thing, but that he was really actually getting help from God in, in that. So hmm. um, I thought that was a nice little, a visual moment to see and peek into the young life of Charles Darwin. Yeah. So he went to boarding school. And then as we already mentioned a couple of times, he didn't really like school and his father realized that he wasn't doing well at school anyway. So, which is interesting in that he pulled him out of boarding school and he put him in Edinburgh university with his brother. And as we mentioned before, is that that was during this time, he's, his older brother Erasmus was already there. And so they were going to school together. At this time, Charles Darwin was about 16 years old. So he wasn't doing well at boarding school. So his father said, okay, I'm going to send to university then instead. <laughs> so he goes there. He spends around two years at Edinburgh. Uh, it, like I said, one year with his brother. Then his brother leaves after finishing his medical, or medical studies. And Charles Darwin doesn't, just doesn't like what he's doing anyway. And at that point, after a couple of years, his father says, okay, then if you're not going to become a physician, again, he wanted him to become a physician. Just like Galileo, they wanted him to become a physician. <laughs> Lawyers are, are ph physicians as long as we yeah. got here. <laughs> yeah. um, Karl Marx's dad wanted him to, be, to become a physician. So we have all, uh, three of the four that we <laughs> went through thus far 
their fathers wanted them to be physicians, of which none of them became physicians. So uh, his father wanted to become a physician. He didn't want to become a physician or wasn't really intensely studying to become a, a, a physician. So he decided, his father decided that he's going to send him to Cambridge. Now, if you can't be a physician, you're going to be a clergyman, which I find extremely fascinating. If you think about it, Charles Darwin was going to become a clergyman at one point. Mm -hmm. And we're at about 1828. So he's uh, at this point, 19 years old, and that he en enters Cambridge, and he stays there for three years. He never becomes a clergyman, and he really has no, not a strong desire to become a clergyman anyway. And th there's a couple interesting <laughs> facts that he said is a phren phrenologist. So phrenologists are the, was a practice, or is a practice, where they looked at the bumps on your head to determine either futures or who you're going to be or, you know, what kind of disposition you have. And from the phrenologist, they said the bumps on his, on his head uh, were equal to about 10 priests. So if you had listened to the phrenologist, he would he'd have been as, as holy as 10 priests. But um, again, he never, he never followed that path. And I think Jason, why don't you go ahead and go ahead and read what, he, what his thoughts were about early Christian beliefs and his beliefs about the Bible. And yeah, I think they had an influence there. Also, I, let me touch on a little bit on his, his education. I was okay, sprung in my memory as you're, as you're going through that as, um, you know, he actually pr apprenticed with his father as a physician before he went off to, off to uh, Edinburgh. And um, he actually said that he, he kind of liked it. He was kind of getting into it, the idea. But one thing that happened when he went to, uh, to the university there, he saw an operation on a boy. Mm. And this is before, um, anesthesia yeah. <laughs> before um i guess chloroform was the first big one so it was before yeah. then so they that was kind of a you read that it was like that was, seemed like the turning point i could imagine that seeing an operation on a on a kid without any <laughs> that'd have been pretty tough so that, that was one of the turning points but this is i want to pull this quote up vince is after he's kind of not doing well in edinburgh there he's he's going his father saw that and he moved him over to cambridge like you're talking about i said he said, uh, after having spent two sessions in Edinburgh, my father perceived or had heard from my sisters that I did not like the thought of being a physician. So he proposed that I should become a clergyman. He was very properly vehement against my turning an idle sportman, sporting man, which then seemed the most probable destination. <laughs> so because of his shooting and hang, you know, hanging out, playing, and um, I, I guess that's touching to me in the sense that, hey, you know, sometimes we don't have it all figured out at age 19. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes we put that pressure on, on uh, that we should, and we should be moving forward to, in our futures. But here's, you know, one of the top most influential people that have ever lived. And in, in his, his 19, his early 20s, he's still kind of trying to figure it out. Yeah. Exploring his, his, his curiosities and, and trying this and trying that. And um, it'd be like, uh, but he also seemed like he got, as part of that journey, I guess this was, somewhat that resonated with me is his, his exploration into religion. Um, I don't know if he did much, much exploring that he, he alludes to here in his, his early days, but it, it evolves throughout his life. But he did say this, and this is right when he went to Cambridge and started his clergyman. He said, um, he said, and I did not then in the least doubt the strict and literal truth of every word in the Bible. I soon persuaded myself that our creed must be fully accepted. And then a little bit later, he says, considering how fiercely I have been attacked by the, by the Orthodox, and this is reflecting back on his life since he's writing this in his 60s, um, considering how fiercely I have been attacked by the Orthodox, it seems ludicrous that I was once intended to be a clergyman. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess that, I, maybe that's what where resonates with me, Vince, is that going through different religious paths in your life and going through different understandings, I've had that too in my life. And so, so, so seeing some of that in Darwin, maybe that scientific curiosity as well um, resonated. So really enjoyed the, this introduction to, to his first, first few years or his, his younger years in, in life of, of Charles Darwin. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just close with saying that I find it, how far, find it fascinating how far curiosity can propel you because that's mm -hmm. what he was. He was, just he was a very curious individual, a good listener, I would say a good conversationalist and just how far that propelled him either to give him direction, a little bit of direction, but put him around people and introduce him to people that were willing to share their expertise with him. So 
I really enjoyed that aspect of it.